Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Desna McKenzie. Desna, hello. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm very well. Very well. And where are you calling from today? Well, I'm based in sunny Croydon in London. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm just down, I've been in South London for most of my life, actually. Brilliant. I'm not sure I've ever heard Croydon being described as sunny, but that's good. Yeah, it was a bit of a dry joke. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But to be fair, most of most of the UK right now is is completely underwater. It's it's uh, been yeah. hasn't stopped raining for, for weeks. Very grey, very wet. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, I've, I've already got an inkling of where this conversation is going to go with your humour coming out already. So brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it, Desna, you're focusing on at the moment? Well, for me, things that I'm looking at at the moment, I'm working with a community group at the moment looking at ways to affect some of the the local dynamics that are going on um people might be aware there was a news article maybe about a month ago where a a young girl in my local area in Croydon was killed and it involved three very young people in our community And it is an ongoing thing that is happening in our local community that we have. There is some knife crime. There is um, issues with with young people being involved in gangs, knife crime, that sort of thing. And so my focus more recently has been on setting up a local action group to look at ways in which we can help local organisations to tackle some of the underlying issues with uh, some of the issues that we have with young people. We have been planning also a local patrol, like school time patrol, so that we have community members visible during the school commute hours, hopefully helping young people to feel safer and to feel that there are people that they can turn to or alert if things happen during the school commute. So, yeah, it's just about mobilising the local community and, and getting back to the community taking responsibility and, and action and accountability and and actually coming together in, in creating solutions. Really. And I know your focus is local, but this is not a local issue. No. And my focus actually isn't local. So I am the founder of Parents of Black Children UK. I am very, and I guess this is how uh, you came to to know of me. Um, Some of the topics that I've spoken on have been around um, specifically navigating the educational system as a parent of a black child <laughs> because we there, there are very real challenges in in that space and so there are there are certainly lots of challenges that are going on within our community that are really rooted in three generations of socioeconomic problems <laughs> um, and so un, unpicking them now becomes absolutely challenging but it's something that I'm really very passionate about because of my own experiences in that space but passionate about but it's just time it's time to really unleash that potential we've got 
particularly my my background I'm Caribbean and so our our boys the black Caribbean boys um seven out of ten of them fail uh, at 16 (laughs) at school and that's a massive amount of potential that is lost. That's that, that's a lot of doors that is cl- that are closed to to that section of society, and they go into adulthood already at an economic disadvantage, and that then shows in other things because then are they able to compete? in the job market are they able to support their families are they able to move into to adulthood in a in a positive way easily and 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 the answer to that is typically no and so I think there's there's lots of work to be done because we look at that number and we have just kept on for some reason feeling that it it's it's normal and that it is the result of some sort of innate they're bad children or they're and and there's much more color to their experiences at school and it is kind of time to start to to think about that and start to 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 empower parents to to move through the system in a way that is cultivating our children's potential because a lot of time they're going into school confident (laughs) they're going into school able and somewhere during that journey there is a disconnect and there is uh there are multiple failures and they're not coming out of that that journey enabled (laughs) and they're not coming out of the journey with the confidence that they went into it with and many times, actually, they're coming out of, of that journey quite traumatised and disenfranchised. So, yeah, that, that is the space that I work in. Going back to the earlier um, focus that you have, which is to help local organisations to tackle the underlying issues. Are the underlying issues in, in both these areas the same? Locally and nationally? <laughs> um I would say that there are very there there are similar issues yeah the underlying issues are similar actually the reason that I have launched a UK chapter of a global organization an organization that opened in Canada and and in and have chapters in America is because actually that picture is a global one there are issues that occur worldwide and have their roots in 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 simple just a global social conditioning in terms of it's an association for me I think it's an association of black faces with danger and with poverty and with all of those things which means that it's very difficult for these communities all over the world to be seen, to be, for for their potential to be seen. We have a narrative that has, that has played through centuries (laughs) that have painted people with black faces, people with brown faces as being violent as being uneducated as being un- um as being dangerous and i think that we're putting our i personally feel that we're putting our children in classrooms where many black parents can tell you when their child went from being regarded as cute <laughs> to being feared, having a five or six or seven or eight year old in a class that children, that that teachers are afraid of is problematic. And it's not necessarily because these children are doing something that's unusual or is, is, is not adolescent 
<laughs> in its roots. It's, it's not something, they're not doing things that their peers are not necessarily doing, right? It, it's about the way in which many times their behaviours are being interpreted and sanctionings that are resulting from those interpretations. So, yeah, I do believe there is a massive proportion of the numbers that we're seeing is 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 absolutely a result of of some of that thinking and i certainly feel that it's a result of that thinking over a number of decades right so i there's a a a, a guy that i was oh, i was on a a call recently and he was talking about he's actually a teacher and he was talking about himself being suspended from school but then he talked about the fact that his father was also suspended and expelled from school and now he's going through the thing of fighting for his child who is about to be <laughs> expelled from school so you have this generational ball that is rolling <laughs> and gathering much moss the ch children that were traumatized at school and had a hard time at school will have a hard time navigating the educational system for their children and advocating for their children and understanding even that that their children could have or get anything positive from an the educational world because their own experiences are or have been traumatic and have led to to, to massive life uh, inequalities <laughs> that they are still dealing with, right? And I think also it, it's worth understanding that I had a great experience myself at school. I started school very early. It's probably where my passion for education came from. But I have had real challenges getting my sons through school and and it is why I've lent into this work because I think that if I'm having challenges and I'm passionate about education and I am fairly well educated and have a decent network around me if I'm struggling to to get my children through then many people will be struggling and it's a vicious cycle I mean I, I just can't even contemplate that figure of seven out of 10 boys that are mm. failing. It, I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking, Desna, heartbreaking, because they then, as you said, those doors are closing at such an early age, 16. And where do they go on as an adult from there? Where do they go on? And it then if they've had a poor experience of education they're not going to be promoting education to their children so it just becomes this cycle that continues where do we break this how can we break this yeah I mean I think this is this is the question I mean there there is absolutely work going on but of course those numbers that seven out of ten has has has, has been in place for a number of decades now it's not shifted massively and I, I I do think it is about, and this is where the, the, I I found in an organisation that is about the community and the empowerment of the community and bringing us together to really start to understand the education system, to really start to give parents tools and a support system to actually navigate that system, to be able to to, to hold conversations which were difficult to hold in in school settings it's difficult to go into settings which you might very well feel very intimidated in maybe the last time you were in a head teacher's office was when you, you were asked to leave right so I and and even just for for anybody else for me I I found it very challenging actually to be in some of those those classrooms and speaking with teachers and and dealing with being bombarded with letters and phone calls and all the rest of it. I think it's about giving parents tools and support and allyship 
in having conversations in those spaces. I think my experience of going through with my son taught me that it was really important to kind of reflect who 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 I was and and also who who my son was in those spaces to give you an example of that for my and I you know prefer to try and give examples from my own experience I've I can remember a time where my son was being sent out of class for a couple of months he was being sent out of class and this was all the way back in maybe year he was 12 he was 12 at the time and he was being sent out with a particular teacher who took him for two different classes and she would just routinely send him out I hadn't we had never had any um, behavioral issues with him he went to a selective school we'd never gone we'd never had any behavioral issues with him previously and I remember going into her and having a conversation and saying well explain to me what's going on because this is very strange for me we've never experienced this and I don't really quite understand what's happened and then she talked about at the start of the term and an event had happened where he had walked into the door and I think he'd burped at the door which is silly behavior and I would and I said to him at the time I made him apologise at the parents' evening, apologise to your teacher, I don't expect you to, to be behaving in that way. But I think something like four or five months on, he was still being sent out of class, and I was like, okay. So when I asked her this, she raised this incident, and I said, well, yeah, you you told me about that at the start of term and I hope that we've kind of drawn a line onto that particular incident and moved on with this and she, she says but he's been sent out routinely so give me some examples of what he's done since then what has he done and she kind of sat there for a little while and she's thinking and she's thinking and I sat and I waited and thought let me give her some time to have a have a think and she then she was a little frustrated she said well I don't know I've, I've put him in front of me and every time I look down he's looking in his bag or he's, he's sharpening his pencil okay <laughs> so I just waited because I wanted her to actually think about what she was saying <laughs> And I said, okay, <laughs> all right. Because actually what that, that told me a couple of things. That told me a couple of things. I, I felt that at the time that she had already decided. She had decided from the start of the term who she thought he was. And then all of her, her reactions were to that one occasion. But also what that told me was that when he was being sent out of class and being sent to senior leaders, no one was asking why. Because she she couldn't answer that question. And I sat for a minute and then I said to her, look, I just want to have a conversation with you, which I hope will turn around your experience with him and unlock his potential in the classroom, because this is what this is about for me as a family we invest a lot of in in education not just financially but also in terms of our time and all of the extracurricular things that we do with the, the children and the co-educating that we do with the children education is very important to me it's important to our family it's what our parents have sacrificed for for us to have those opportunities and I said to her look for my son in particular he's a people's person that's what he is so yes he looks like a 30 year old he's very very tall but he's 12 <laughs> he's a 12 year old and what is important to him is is how he can is that connection is 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 being able to to have that personal connection with people. And I said, all I said to her actually was, if you, if you encourage him, if you're positive with him, he will walk over hot coals for you. That's all I said to her. I said, I left her with that. If you encourage him and you're positive with him in the way that you speak 
to him, he will walk over hot coals for you. And that was it. I, I went off. That was a 15 minute conversation. I went off and two weeks later, she, she sent me through an email. And in this email, she said, oh, Miss McKenzie, I'm very, I've got to thank you for your intervention. And he's, he's an absolutely different child. His behavior has been, it, it has, has been, it's been a complete 180. It's been a complete turnaround. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I wrote a, a, an email back to her that said, well, I, I appreciate that you've taken on board what I've said. I appreciate that you've actually taken all of that on board. But what I do also really want to point out to you is that I didn't have a conversation with him. I only had a conversation with you. So he's not a different child. <laughs> You're a different teacher. And, and I feel like a lot of the times because our children are faced with fear, you have situations in classrooms where teachers try to lay down that authority in this sternness. And our children don't, under we, they don't understand why they're being spoken to differently to their peers. And actually their peers also don't understand why He's been spoken to differently. I've had children come into my house and say, oh, she hates him. She talks to him like, right? So it sometimes it is about giving out what you want to receive and just treating children humanely with humanity. It's also about really thinking about whether... whether we're even in the way that we we react to situations right i i i talk about with some people i talk about this communal fear that we have of spiders and i know it's it feels like a diversion but it's like it's it's weird to me actually that the that almost the whole of society has this this fear of spiders yet you can barely find somebody that has actually had a uh, negative, a real negative experience with a spider, right? We have, but we have these fears because they are rolled out at Halloween, they're rolled out in all these horror stories, whatever. So they're, they're negative things and people are afraid of them and they react in a way that is over the top when, when, <laughs> when we see this, this little thing, right? That is more afraid of us than we are, of, than we should be of them, right? And I feel like it's the same actually with black boys, <laughs> is that a lot of the times the fear that we're exercising towards them is, is based on a social conditioning that has come through the things that we see on the media, the things that we see in films, the things that we've seen that have, that have come through all of this conditioning that we get that says that this, this thing is, is dangerous. And, and actually we're traumatising and we're, we're closing doors to those children very early on. And those sorts of experiences or a lot of children can end up with those children being disenfranchised in school. And now they do become then a much greater target for gangs. They become a much greater target for crime. They, it's, it, it, it does become a slippery slope. So I think all of these things play into closing the doors of opportunity to, to children and culling them down a particular route. And what um, I find really interesting, Desna, is you said that it's not happening at peer level. So where you would hope that this would not continue in a, in terms of intergenerationally and it keeps going and it keeps happening. And you said that this, this has been an issue that has been prevalent for decades. If it's not happening at peer level and then it skips and comes in again at teacher level, or it's not even it's skipping it, but you know what I'm saying? Something is is being learned as a new behavior in between the peer time and then as a teacher role. 
Um, I think it's lots of things. I mean, I, I, I do think demographics come into it. I think, don't forget that in, in a number of school systems, diversity is, is is a challenge, especially when it comes to senior leadership within schools. I I have even recently had a, had recorded a podcast with with some teachers, and you know, actually, in the state system, there there are a lot of black teachers, absolutely. But what we're not we're still not seeing, even in the state system, is a a promotion of those teachers. We're not seeing them progress onto see, senior leadership. Role. And and even the the head teachers that we are seeing, many of them are having real challenges in those those spaces. And so actually it begs the question that if our black teachers and adults are having a hard time in those spaces, then how do we cater for black children in those spaces? Yeah, I, I recorded a fantastic episode with Caroline Flanagan, which will be out after your episode, actually. So it will be in a couple of episodes time. And she works specifically with black lawyers. Mm. So Caroline Flanagan is championing black lawyers and how to not see that you're the only black in the room, but to understand that you're the first and this is the shift between not being the only one, but being the first and then demonstrating to be that role model to show how you can you can be who you want to be. And absolutely, the challenge is there. I'm not denying it at all. Mm. And, it, and, and as he's saying, it, it's becoming this self-fulfilling cycle and, and self-fulfilling prophecy of, of people assuming the behavior is there, even though it's not. And the, the example that you shared of the teacher saying that your son had completely changed his behavior, but you hadn't spoken to him. So clearly it hadn't. And it's it's seeing what's not there. Yeah, I think this happens far more frequently than 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 people talk of. And these these are things that I speak with, I, I speak to my peers about all of the time. I have a mastermind group of about eight black mothers and all of them have had issues and 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 they range from lawyers to doctors to <laughs> they're all professional women and i don't think there's been one of them that 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 has come through the journey without challenge and and this is what we have to see is that that 70% covers a very broad range of, of demographics within the black community. It really does. Yeah. And 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 there, there are some real challenges that we we have to start to look at and deal with because it impacts everybody, it impacts all of society. It's such a waste of the potential of these children. So the solution or solutions or working towards a solution? Yeah, I think the, there are many solutions. I think uh, everything that happened after the death of George, George Floyd, there, there were some positive changes within the UK in terms of, very specifically, I think, in terms of ears being more open, in, in terms of there being much more dialogue in terms of, I think, people within our community understanding that actually it was time to, to, to be less silent about, less graceful about what was happening, right? I realised personally I had to question myself and get to a point where I was like, okay, have I done enough? Have I said enough about my experiences to ensure that my children don't go through the same things as they go into the workforce or that my grandchildren, whenever they're born, are not going through the same things as they go into schools. Yeah. So I think it, it is really about people making that change from where they stand. And it's not just about our own community mobilizing and, 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 and being more vocal and, 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 standing up and safeguarding our children and setting really the st a standard of what we will, what we expect, <laughs> right? But it's also about the wider community and that allyship of, of just understanding 
there are things that are happening in our community or to our children that don't make sense so we talk about the 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 recent child q case where the 15 year old child who was strip searched at school because they smelt cannabis on her so they strip searched her and i sit here and i think okay so for all the people that have 15 year olds at school at home think about that for a minute <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. Think about your daughter coming home and telling you that she was stripped naked at school and then put back in into an examination room to do an exam. And so it, it, it just is, we have to get back to just humanity treating people like humans remembering that 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 everyone is a human being and thinking about putting yourself in that person's shoes and and is that acceptable we have to also stand up in those spaces and are we individually people that would stand up and 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 do something if we saw these things happening because that's always the most challenging thing for me watching is that in that case there were a number of teachers that were involved in that scenario there were a number of professional people that are trained in safeguarding probably some that had ch children of their own, right, that have all come to the conclusion that that series of events was okay. And then when you look at that particular scenario, that case is still being fought. We have run out of just the bandwidth to keep fighting for things for basic things basic 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 things basic decency basic safety of our children basic regard three years later still fighting through court for that it's like an it's like an additional abuse and when you speak to the lawyers that are in that space that are working in that education space and they're working on those cases and they know that child Q is just one of many. Yeah, just one of many, right? They, they're worn out. They're worn out. So it is about really, it's about allyship. It's about everybody looking on other people as human beings and really being prepared to, to 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 be the voice and to stand up and to point out when when certain things are not acceptable disproportionate it's remembering that a black child is a child as well we see and certainly as parents we see the reactions towards and and the sanctions for misbehavior are not not only not equal, but sometimes so extreme, it's really hard to justify. And most of us are able within the community to, to, to call out several examples of these things that we see. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a daily experience. We're watching that. We're watching this disproportionality. Our children are watching that disproportionality. They're watching that unfairness. And as long as they are helpless and subjected to that unfairness, that creates disenfranchisement. That pushes our children to the fringes of society. And... It's a circular thing. So what helps? <laughs> Let's go back to what helps. I, I, I think allyship, I think people being prepared to, to see and understand and stand up and, and speak out on in whatever space that you are in. If you're a teacher, if you're a, 
police officer, if you're looking after children of, uh, in any way, shape or form or around children in any way, shape or form, if you're in the workplace, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's looking for that. It's, it's being prepared to, to speak up and understand that. I think for me, I've been very focused in on empowering parents and empowering our community to, to come together and feel more empowered in spaces that they have not traditionally felt empowered in. So giving them a much more power in that education space to understand the system and actually realise that they have a right to 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 stand and 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 to demand certain basic protections for their kids for their children and what i'm hearing and i understand now more fully the importance of education is not necessarily about the what you're coming out with in terms of results it's about understanding just how you are shifting and changing the future because if you're teaching children properly and and giving you're giving them a better future and a better world will come as a result of that so education is at the foundation of this conversation it really is i mean education for me is it is a lot of things i mean i come from a jamaican heritage and I, I was the first person in in my family to go to university, but I I watched my mum who was removed from school at eleven, and I I watched her as a child. I watched her struggle, really struggle, and realised that it it was so clear for me even as a six year old that actually education was the thing that allowed you to to touch your dreams to really be in touch with to really realize your purpose and your dreams it was a a real channel towards having a voice and having the resources that you needed absolutely it's not it's not the only one there are others but i tell you that there are so many people that are simply limited by the fact that they have not had any formal education or they've been removed from formal education. When I went off to university, I can remember being in college actually and wanting to go to university and not actually knowing anybody that had ever been to university and not really having anyone around me that I could speak to about university or university choices or about professional choices. I didn't have any of that around me and actually going into university and starting to form these amazing networks and now I look back I think to myself I remember when my son turned 18 and I had a video made with actually I had probably about 20 men in my life create a video for him and just give him some words of advice for the next stage but what was amazing with me watching that back is I was sitting there and I was looking at lawyers and doctors and architects and actors and and this massive network that had been made in in that span of time that I absolutely didn't have at his age right it opens up a world to to young people and to people in a particular demographic. It opens up an, a network that is absolutely needed, is absolutely freeing, is absolutely transformational. And yeah, I mean, that's one of the areas that I now think that we have to be so very careful of because there's so many changes that have been made in the last year or two that has made it much harder for people from from certain demographics to get into higher education yeah we've made it the the loan system is 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 incredibly expensive and people don't realize actually how the expense how much the expense has changed where we were paying maybe four percent or something on our, our if it was even that that high on our our loans they're now paying 10 12% on on their loans and they're paying that 
that interest from the time that that loan lands in their account. So they're they're paying interest on 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 massive amounts even before they've even finished studying. Yeah, we used to be able, our interest was not calculated until when we finished our degrees. Um, so that that has changed, and also obviously the cost has changed. So now you're you're paying your fees. So you've got a ten grand university fee to pay to start off with, and it's probably about I would say about eight grand for accommodation. So many children are taking out twenty thousand pounds a year, and I think when I left uni, I left with a, a a loan of about loans of about six grand, and now our, our children are leaving uh university with loans of at least 80 on an interest rate of 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 10 percent right so it, it is it, just where we're, we're making the the barriers are getting bigger in the to, to going into higher education and to people actually having options and escaping Having that social mo mobilization, we are we, we are putting up extra barriers for 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 this next generation. Um, and you, you said, Desna, that you you saw education and how it as a six year old, it's it was possible then to touch your dreams and your purpose. Hmm. Describe to me what your your purpose is, what your focus on why is. <laughs> for me, it has come back down to to education. <laughs> It really has. It's come back down to education. I've worked out that I am a product of faith. I'm a product of faith. So many people that came before me, so many of my ancestors survived another day simply because they absolutely believed that their children and their children's children would have better. I'm a product of faith and I do feel that it is absolutely my purpose to bring the baton home on that. It's time, it's the time, it's the time that we can start to bring the baton home on all of those, um, all of our four parents who invested, they sowed that seed, <laughs> yeah, to something that they knew they would never eat the fruit themselves, but they absolutely knew that their children or their children's children would have that freedom. And for me, um, it's about bringing that baton home now. And I certainly, I've done that for my children and I want to do that for children in my community. I hear you. I see it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and you spoke of sacrifice earlier and it's not just sacrifice, is it? This is this is a, a desire. This is a, a passion. This is a, a complete understanding that you, you there is no other way. You don't want it to be any other way than bringing this home. Yeah, I mean, it's about it's about potential and it's about light. It's about us being able to make sure that we're not dimming the light of all of the this generation that are coming through you it's like throwing gold in the bin to me i i don't quite understand it i i just feel like there's there's so much potential there's so much light there's so much they are they they are future they they are the things that will transform our world going forward so we have to choose what we plant into them. Do we want our world transformed into more brightness <laughs> or where do we want to go with that? Yeah, I think it is about just preserving, preserving confidence. When, when my children went into schooling, the, the key thing that I wanted for my children was that their confidence was preserved because actually without confidence, all the rest kind of doesn't matter. If you can't preserve that confidence, it's very difficult to, to to preserve the potential that is there. So it, for me, it's about preserving confidence and cultivating their potential and really being intentional about that. So as parents, as teachers, as a community, because again, it's about going back as well to those for us, what was for us a very natural community-based parenting 
where we all take responsibility and accountability for the young people in our communities, really going back to that where we are all helping each other and sharing with each other and sharing information and moving, moving the needle forward collectively. Lesna, I am deeply moved by your work and I really feel that a lot of people will want to get in touch with you and, and connect with you. So what's the best way? for them to do that yeah you can you can reach me and see some of my work on my website is parents of black uk, and also we will be launching a podcast in the new year called higherplayingfield.com so and i'm happy to actually provide a free gift to those that go on to parents of black uk forward slash focus on why and there'll be something in there for you <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. And it, it, it is a, a resource that will be invaluable. And let's hope that no, no, it's not a hope. It's a it's a an absolute must that this number must change. And I know that you picked on a specific statistic and that that's not representative of, of all the other issues and all the other demographics as well. That's just one particular, the Caribbean seven out of 10 boys that you, you shared. So let's change the needle let's move the needle let's change the future and and ensure that our children are taught in in a way that removes all discrimination and bias absolutely absolutely yeah Desna thank you so much for sharing your focus on why it really has been a very moving conversation and I will be reflecting on this conversation in in my reflections with actions episode and and talking more about some of the issues that you've shared in in that one but have you got some final words please for the listeners i just i think the 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 key thing at the moment and with so much of what's going on at the moment is to remember it's humanity and just to remember that we're all human beings. And I, I I keep going back. My mother used to always say that the, the, the most important commandment was to treat others as you wish to be treated, right? And I think sometimes actually, if we really lean into the, those things, when we're seeing things happening, when we're party to certain situations, really, th- put, put yourself, put your children in, in into that place and just think on it think about what that might be like yeah it's humanity it's really coming back to treating people as humans treating people as 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 you want to be treated how has this conversation had an impact on you what value have you received from tuning in what are your reflections with actions Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.